We are so excited to welcome you to our gallery talk with Kathy Caraccio here in the exhibition of Full Circle, Teaching, Creating, and Curating. Kathy Caraccio is a master printer, artist, and art collector who has worked with numerous artists throughout the years. On our afternoon together, we'll begin with Bill Hosterman, GVSU professor, um, whose work is also featured in this exhibition, interviewing Kathy. Bill first met Kathy when he went to intern at her print shop, and that relationship has continued over the years and eventually led to this wonderful exhibition. I don't want to take up any more of your time, so please join me in welcoming Kathy and Bill. How could we die? Uh, I, I, it was one, one of my first questions is when I saw the show hung, I realized how uh, red orange was focused and didn't quite realize how that occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't see it all gathered until we got it published onto the computer. Right. Do you mm -hmm. remember thinking that I had a <coughs> color focus? Yeah, after I selected the show, which is this show that's behind us, then I realized how much red there was, but that was completely like unintentional. But then I realized it was something that I was attracted to. Um, so I'm not sure why that was exactly, but it kept on showing up in my work too. Yeah. It's a beautiful compliment to your great, great mm -hmm. blue tones. Mm -hmm. Who actually selected where things went on the wall? Is that your? That was Thank you. you. Thank you. It's, it's such a beautiful show. And I believe I've been in and out of a lot of buildings. It's wonderful the exposure to original art with a well produced inventory tank the information is. It's so delightful. And actually the caliber of students really has stepped up because I don't know who's part of your collection and part of the, the uh, student body's work showing in the hallway. So kudos on your on your efforts and, and it's succeeding. And thank you for the tour yesterday. I got to tour this, the, uh, Bill and I got to tour the storage facility and they got to show us their favorites. So it was like they were they were taking all their best toys out of the candy box and showing all we like caramels. This chocolate's very special. Let's take a look at that. And uh, showed traditional work, but then showed work that our contemporary artists are doing. And very prideful to be in this opportunity to be participant in this very large university. Oh my God. But it's perfect because the snow equaled the university's status. It's kind of the big pillows of snow, the winter weather, the vistas. It's impressive. Yeah, looks to it. Microphone. So, yeah. um, Kathy has been a printmaker or a printer for like over 45 years in New York City. And she started collecting this work really soon after she went ahead and started to get into printmaking, I think. So, my first question is. What gets you most excited about collecting work as far as the work that's here, but also she has over 6,000 works that are original prints in her collection. And when I go into her print shop, which is 20 feet by 20 feet, it's 200 square feet. It is mostly filled up by flat files. And so there's a giant press in the middle of this place, this print shop, and then we have to move around the press this way, because <laughs> everything is very tight in there. So you can touch everything in standard ones. Yeah. So when she opens up the drawer, she can't fit any more prints in the drawers because they're so full of prints that are there. So I would go through and just be impressed by all this work. So my question is, what got you excited about collecting work? Yeah. I'm a child of depression era parents who left high school to go work for the family and nothing got thrown out in our house. And my mother's name was Clara, and the doorbell would ring, and someone would say, Clara, I'm throwing out this piece of furniture. Are you interested? Because it wound up in the incinerator, room, and she'd make us drag it in. And at some point, I couldn't touch the walls of my house because it was three deep of furniture. Because when you suffer poverty and deprivation, it reflects on how you're going to proceed in life. And I'm still. I still walk out to the street where the car is traveling to see a penny. I'll bet I'll stop traffic to bed down and pick it up because I'm not going to waste that penny. It's just still instinctual. So I'm a greedy child who wants everything that my mother wanted me to have. <laughs> we were not that we were hoarders, but nothing left. The ability to throw things out is new. People writing about, you know, cleaning up your space. And Marie. 
Uh, I threw her book across the room. <laughs> her, her, her strategy was so beyond doing for me that, um, so I own everything I collected. I just recently read a book by Malcolm Gladwell where he talked to collections about how they uh, grade their collections and it turns out curators want to move forward and add new things to the collection, but he said, how do you deaccession it? And he said, we will not eat our children. This, we will not cannibalize the collection. And he said, so where is all that dusty old work that you'll never see? And they're like, oh, it's in rental storage. It's just off somewhere. And he found one curator who said to his staff when he got hired, give me a grade for the artwork in your collection, A, B, or C. And uh, a, I want to keep it, it's my best collection, it's my Van Gogh, this is our pride. B, it's a good teaching collection, we want to keep this, uh, you know, in the, the potential of focus and borrowing. And C, you can stay in the basement and collect and does for all we care. And he said, what if we sell, if everybody great gives a grade to everything you own, what are we going to do with the C's? Can we sell that and start an educational program? And they were like, yeah, let's do that. It was so healthy to be able to clean up. So I went through, it's actually 10,000 prints cataloged, 2,500 are photographed, 6,000 are spoken about. I gave everything an A, B, or C grade, which I found easy to do. And then I realized I can let go of the C grade work. And I started gifting it, planning who's gonna get that. That's, that's, that's gonna be Joel's job is to do, deal with what I wanna download. <laughs> Oh, you need a new collection. So um, I'm at the part where now I'm ready to um, let it be seen, let it be witnessed. Me seeing it beautifully framed and matted. This is so excellent. This is better than real galleries. This is the spaciousness on the frames and the care of the way it's hung. It's really very, very beautiful. Thank you. So, so one of the inspirations for the show is the idea of education and mentorship. So since we are in a university, I was thinking about that quite a bit when I was curating the show. So my question is, out of the work that's here from your collection, what person that did the work would be a mentor for you or that you feel perhaps you would learn the most from within the collaboration? Because Kathy printed for much of the work that's here. So I don't know how many of the pieces, but I would say it's probably over half of the work that she went ahead and actually worked with the artist and then went ahead and they came up with the idea and then printed it or she printed it. So as far as what you got from them as far as mentorship or that you learned the most as far as when you collaborated with them. I'm not collecting the art in the beginning. I'm collecting the stories of the artists, where their inspiration came from, what's their backstory. Why did they make those marks? Frequently I brought the plate, and then we realized the plate together as a print. So I proved that I talked to them about color. I will always visit the studio if I have that opportunity to be in their personal space, because my space is not their space. They have to readjust, they don't have their toys, they don't have their storyline. So I visit them, spend a day with them in their studio, talk, pick brain, find out what what's important to them. Uh, what their goal is to make a print, because they may be painters or sculptors. Why do they want to do it in printmaking? And it's usually there's a marketplace. Prints are lucky that they have a multiplicity as originals, and they hit a marketplace, and there's a chance to disseminate. So they want their primo piece to be made into some kind of print. I will not use any photographic or digital techniques. And I know they use them in silkscreen, and I don't even do that. You have to put your hand to the plate or to the medium that we're doing. And that's a challenge, so I only accept artists in the studio who want to be there. I don't solicit my artists. I don't knock on the door and say, I want to work with you. Although I did for Yvonne Delcate. And she made a plate, and it wasn't dry. And before she got it to the studio, she brought a goose neck lamp down on top of the image. It was a plastic plate and the plate melted and warped. So I never got to print for a okay? So that was like, uh, why am I scratching up this hill? This is not gonna work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who I learned from, there's so much storytelling behind what these pieces are about. And then I add my story of interpretation, why I favored the piece, why I'm glad to be able to show it. Who did I learn from? This artist, Myrna Carlyle, she 
must be about almost not 89, I think she is. Um, her technique she got in England, and it's like no other technique, but it looks like a traditional print. Uh, what she does to make that print is an amazing story in itself. And so when I have the artist who prints their own work bring me a piece, I get to pick brain on learning new techniques, thinking new about how soft ground might work, how aquatin might work, how sanding might work, what substrate is it zinc, is it copper, is it, is it steel? There's so much to learn. There's so many nooks and crannies. So my agenda as a student was to be in the path of learning. I met a woman when I waitressed my way through college, and she was once a stockbroker. She was. She told me these stories, and I thought she's a liar. She's making this up. And she said, "I change my job every six months. Keeps me fresh." She just moved from job to job, and I thought, "I'm going to do that. I'm not going to settle for just the same old, same old. I'm going to move around." And in printmaking, the moving around happens because I'm in that realm of wanting variety and accepting your level of work, whatever you want to bring to the print. And it's happiness all along. And I, I love that the curators who saw the show, who are artists, liked the work when it was received. Of course, we were sending digital pictures, and maybe they were scratching their head going, what's this about? And then they got to see it, see the actual physicality of the print. That's what's important about it hanging in artwork being hung in the university. Oh my God. It's so wonderful to see it to scale with, with good lighting. That's the other thing. Your schools are full of good lighting. There's not dark corners in the bottom of my brain. You can't put artwork there. Really wonderful work. Really great to see. This gallery is great. <laughs> uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, I think you did. I'll ask another one that's kind of related. I'll ask another. So one of the people that has a print in the show is Robert Blackburn, and the print is right over here. That's a woodcut that he did. Robert Blackburn operated and ran a print shop in New York City. It was essentially an open door print shop for the longest time. He started in like the 1940s, and it was basically a place where people from other cultures, unrepresented areas of the world could come in and make a print. And essentially, it was free for them to go ahead and work there. And that's where Kathy got her start. So Kathy actually apprenticed there for four years. And then she went ahead and out of that, started to go ahead and print. So my question is, specifically about the Bearden print that's over here, and how that occurred as far as you getting that plate and the story behind the idea of what you were given with the opportunity of that and what that led to. Um, I started school in the Bronx at Hunter College, which in while I was there transitioned to become another named university. All the Hunter College professors went downtown to the downtown campus. We were up by a reservoir up in the Bronx where we had a big football field and tennis courts and beautiful, large campus, um, and they brought in a new faculty because the old faculty went downtown, and my teachers were only three years older than me. They were just out of grad school. It was play with me. If I was excited, they'd be excited. I was that type of student that the teachers gravitated toward me and wanted to work, because I was endless energy, and they were willing to, great, we got someone who's receiving, it's not just the same old, same old. I want to make a correction. It's an intolerable print. It's oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I left school, I said to my teacher, Arun Bose, who studied with Krishna Reddy, this is an important piece of um, collecting. I, didn't, um, I, I was a student of Krishna. It's a print called viscosity, which is a type of print where you use rollers and you change the liquidity of the ink. So some inks are runny and some inks are more like peanut butter and you can play a roller technique on top, and all that color is on that plate. There's no registration, it goes through once. So he sculpts the plate, he's a sculptor, and he uses electric engraving tools, and it's just glorious with the play of color. Um, he's, uh, Krishna's from India, and so was Arun, and they studied together at a famous studio in, in Paris, uh, France, uh, Atelier 17, which is now being 
lionized as the seedbed of so many artists that are in New York that worked or knew of teachers from Atelier 17. So I'm an advocate of this type of printing. So I go to the Blackburn studio, it's 1972. I'm a newlywed and I, he has big rollers, so I'm doing viscosity, I'm making big plates, bigger than I did at school. And I have all this color rolled out and Bob Blackburn comes over to me. Hold on. He brings me this big, beautiful copper plate and he says, uh, could you roll some color on that? And I'm like, uh, what? He says, you got all this roller color. Can you, can you put some color on this plate? I'm like, whose plate is this? He says, it doesn't matter. I'm like, why would I do that? I rented the day to be at the press. I'm now, I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie there and I'm paying rent by the month. And I'm like, uh, this is my palette. Who, what's the palette of this artist? He said, it doesn't matter. I like your colors. Just put this on there. And I'm like, I rented the press for the day. I don't know why I'm being asked to put this on somebody else's plate. And he said, I will pay you $5 an hour. Well, that's 1972. The subway was 15 cents. Coffee was a dime. Pizza was 25 cents. Pizza was expensive, actually. Things were so reasonably priced. That $5 an hour, and I didn't have a job that morning, and I had a job by the afternoon. He said, I said, how many do you need? He said, give me a dozen samples of your work. And I went in there and I noodled around and I put out what's called a la bouquet, okay, colored a section, colored another section, kind of almost hand painted them, rubbed it down. Then I did the viscosity roller on top of that and added what Krishna does. If you come around, you'll see the print. It's, it's called The Family. Romeo Bearden is probably the most distinguished, uh, he's now passed, African American artists who promoted artists of color to be participant in their community talk about their uh, particular quality of lifestyle. And so this plate was, this was my hand coloring and my viscosity printing. I did a dozen prints. I got paid for two days of work. Oh, hallelujah. Right out of school, got me a job. I was happy to care. And I did four years at Blackburns to equivalent to be the equivalent of a master's degree. So I learned master printing by picking everybody's brain. How did you do that? Why did you do that work? Why did you make these choices? So I got to ink up this man's plate. And it was a coloring book job. And so all of the is rubbing ink into a section. And then Blackburn comes back with, with one print, which Romare has then added a turquoise watercolor to. So you can see this washing turquoise. And he says, we need 250 of these. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm just like an innocent bystander and I've just been hit by a truck. Uh, you're going to get to be a master printer just because you have a good palate or you had willingness to do this. And I thought, what do I get paid? And he said, you are going to bid the job. Just don't overbid it so we don't lose the job. And I thought, I'm bidding a job? I mean, all of a sudden I'm in a professional setting. And that was the gift of Bob Blackburn. That's who he was. He initiated, he set seeds, and then he pushed you off the ledge, and you learned to fly because if you didn't fly, you fell. And so I made this print, and then I started the edition, and then I needed to train people to work with me. And all of this, all these little plates, there are 13. I, I'm very good with a knife, actually. Here's where all a, the time. There's a, there's a story about yeah. this knife oh, yeah. travels in the <laughs> airplane in my handbag. It never gets caught. It's a, a, an architect gave it to me. Uh, who's who's in her 80s and she's still teaching and she's a famous architect, Susan Sharon Sutton. It's a breakaway blade. It's better than the, uh, this is an Alpha brand, Japanese. The uh, X-Acto knife is what most people use, but they don't want to change the blade because you have to find the blades and put it in and change the blade. This is always a fresh blade when you need it because it has a little gizmo on the bottom. Break the blade, you have a fresh blade. So I cut the plate. I'm fearless with a knife and a, a cutting tool. So there's one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I just saw this plate. It's in a show with the print. The plates travel because they they're it's so impressive what he did. And he was a collagist, so it was perfect. He made the collage that made this print, and then I got to play on top of it. It's kind of a collaboration without talking to the artists. 
But this was the palette I had out, and this is what he got, and then he added watercolor. Mm -hmm. And then I started auditioning. It took a year and a half to do the audition. And we moved studios during it. So they moved us into a studio that had no lights or running water, so that the, that wasn't moved by the movers, that was moved by the printers. And we started working just by daylight, which brought us back to a 19th century quality of life, which is very interesting. Because printmaking is very, you can do it by candlelight, frankly, you don't need electricity. And so this was the start of a kind of Kathy version of what I could be doing with my life and how to, how to be a freelancer and how to get a job and how to estimate a job. And, um, finally, I got to meet the artist, which was interesting. I didn't collaborate with the artist at the beginning. I collaborated with Bob Blackburn, who collaborated with the artist. And this has become a famous print. They made a book about it. So I got my foot in the door on the first hanging out at Blackburn's. Mm -hmm. Made my day. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> yeah, I know. He was a beautiful artist himself. Yeah, he was yeah. remarkable. He was really something. So he got his, I think, claim to fame by printing for Robert Rauschenberg, one of her. You know, Jasper Johns. Jasper Johns, Johns yeah. A studio called Universal Artists Limited Edition. Yeah. Prints. And apparently at the print shop, they wanted to have a printer that really knew what they were doing. And so Bob Blackburn's name came up. And so they contacted him. And then he went out to Long Island and started to print for these artists. And then at the same time, he was still running this print shop. That was some, the place where I visited when I went to New York City. My next question actually is the connections in between the prints that are here. And then, so the Bearden print was what we started with. But then soon after that, you got to meet Emma Amos, who's here. And you knew Emma for 35 years, I think. Easy. Easy. And they collaborated together a, a lot uh, over the years. Emma was an artist that actually was in a group that was called Spiral, which Spiral was a group of African-American artists that Bearden was in, and she was the only woman in that group. Years later, she was one of what's called the Gorilla Girls. The Gorilla Girls was a group, yeah, was a group of artists that wore gorilla masks and basically were advocating for having more women represented and different genders represented within museums and galleries. And so this is her print right here. And so I'd love for you to talk about Emma a little bit. Well, this particular print was the last print we worked on together. We made it at the Blackbird Studio. My st I moved next door to the Blackbird Studio for access to, they have a guillotine. They have at least 3,500 square feet and I have 200 square feet. So they have the equipment I can leave my studio, make a U-turn into the next building where contiguous buildings and use their facilities, grab an intern, bring them back, have them help them with something. It's a wonderful community of people who are loved to be hands-on. And I found that, I, I said this this morning, I invented this one this morning. The printmaking is the teddy bear of the art mediums. It's very lovable and it's hand friendly and it's very, you know, it's, it satisfies some of the things. So this was made specifically for a fundraiser for Camille Billups. Who is, did the piece, I am black, There's I am dangerously black. I am black, right? I am black, I am dangerously black. Yes. She and her husband, Jim Hatch, collected film. He did an archive of artists of color, interviews. Uh, she was also a ceramicist. And I got to print for Camille and hear all her salty stories. She was a very vituperous person. She loved to badmouth everybody. Emma, on the other side, was sweet as a light. She never said a bad thing. Uh, two African-American women who taught me something about race and what's happening in particularly New York City and the inequality of housing and all the, you know, all the problems with not just being female, but being a black female and how you have to supersede uh, the notions of who you are to become somebody powerful. And she made a bequest to the collection in Georgia, and I'll think of it, Emory College Library has made a room for her, but to make that room work, she had a fundraise. So she asked Emma to do a, an image that they would use as a fundraising vehicle. And so she made this piece, which is what Emma says, she's always portraying herself. And she's told me, she knows she has Cherokee blood. 
She has a mixed race background, on top of being ID'd as an African American and using that, although she said, I hate the hyphenated word. She didn't actually tell me why, but I can see how labeling is a big problem. And so she, she said, call me black, just forget the African American. And so she was very beautiful. Maybe she wasn't that beautiful, but she maintained a beauty. She had her hair dressed three times a week. Someone came in, and she had all these different hairdos. You have to, you have to see the pictures of them. She changed. She grew up in Georgia, the Matthew Flower. Most things have an iconography that's based on the life of the artist. So this is the Dormwood is the, the uh, state flower of uh, Georgia. And because it was going to a Georgia university, she wanted that in. And she's talking about one eye is green, one eye is red. It's a very interesting kind of play on that. And the woman is always Emma. Emma always depicted herself in her pictures. And if you look up anything about Emma Amos, she's frequently in a bathing suit. And she's laying on the beach and she's looking at you. She's making eye contact with you. You can gaze back at her. She's defying that old story about people being photographed to be looked at, but as subject matter, not as people. And so she always tends to make eye contact with you, which is interesting that she manages that. She's a beautiful draftsman, but she likes to work loosely. And uh, this has a, a technique called shinkole. Anybody touch down on that? We're gluing shin, meaning Chinese, pronounced in French, kole, meaning to glue. All these petals, there's like too many of them, uh, we'll glue down to the page to kind of round it out a little bit further. Then I did pochoir, which I did a demonstration of pochoir. Who saw that demonstration? Um, the, the red in the interior was going to be too hard to make a plate that matched those little dots in the middle of all those flowers, so I just used a little stencil and just watercolored in uh, the red. I watercolored in the red on the face and the eyes, but the other colors shades of brown. So she always talked about uh, our labeling systems. She started a course at Rutgers University. She called it ACDC, which I'm not exactly sure of where that is. ACDC means several, several different things. I think it was a band as well. Um, she decided that we have created a hierarchy of terminology. We have fine art and we have craft. And so one is above the other. And she's like, it's all creative process. That labeling system is for the marketplace to play what's cachet, who's in, who's out. It's, a, it's another type of segregation. It's another type of uh, down, downing somebody to up somebody else. And so she, she kind of, that's the storyline behind this multi-faced, um, there's, there's many references to Janice and, and the theater multi-faced, you know, the Janice. So Emma made the plate. I brought her the copper, I polished it. We did a soft ground, she drew the image as a simple line, and she added a, a term that's in her making called aquatint. Anybody did aquatint? So she does a, an aquatint, we used a big box of blackburns, and I etched the plate. So I'm the controller, I make little samples of everything before we etch, so I know that acid will give me this etch, and then I proof it and say which tone in this sample plate. So that that's my job, as a technician, I simplify getting right to what you want instead of you having to make a new play, try it again, manipulate everything. So we made that, and it was a gift to Camille to fundraise for this collection. And she's, this, this is one of the prints that left the studio like that. I had a few extra prints, and everybody wanted it. Because it kind of sum up, summarizes this sensibility. So I have another question, but I want to see if anybody has a question here that you just want to ask Kathy or me. But anything that you folks can think of, any questions? No? Who's taking printmaking? So you've started collecting because you do trade portfolios. Um, I. It's the first video class we've not done pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I keep loving it exactly. because of the camaraderie of the presses. It's different than a painting class or a drawing class. Where you're an individual with the teacher. In the print shop, you're a community around a press. And if this one's screwing up, you might catch that. Or they may see you doing something that you need 
So the shared sensibility around techniques and materials is wonderful to have that kind of community. Yeah. It's also a very fem female community, which is a shared community. It's almost a kitchen in the different chapters, that kind of mm -hmm. shared uh, yeah. culinary kind of. And things that happen in the kitchen also happen in the print shop, so there's this wonderful uh, situation of shared um, habitat of uh, how to go about things. Mm -hmm. By the end, you do a trade portfolio. And so some of them you won't care for, because maybe you didn't care for that person, or you didn't care for how they rendered it. But other pieces you'll think, oh, wow, she hit the mark. She's going she's gonna to go far. That's an I'm collecting the next female Picasso uh, mm -hmm. from the from the class, or I am the next female because of the crisis. The idea of the and then, so that drives a collector. So that's part of what I do. Is I saw things I wanted, my greedy child. Uh, I traded in the four years I was at Blackburn's, I accrued 90 prints. Some I printed, the rest I traded because I was rapacious in, in production. And so people wanted my work, I'd say, would you trade with me? And I'd show a portfolio and they'd say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of that going on in the community of printmaking. The community is what Bob Blackburn brought together. He never locked his door. You could stay all night. People slept there. You'd come in the, I was the morning monitor. People would be sleeping on the tables. And they'd use up all the acid. And they'd etch through the plate to the other side. I mean, they burned through acid. Because they could leave it in the acid and go to sleep. Nobody seemed to care. Mm -hmm. And they started doing sculpture. And I realized as I watched this go by that I'm a sculptor, not a painter, in my sensibilities about materials. And I loved cutting up the plates. That's why that became uh, an industry that was very simplified. So let me see if this is shaped. Most of the world is presented in rectangles, which is an architectural format. It's not a natural <coughs> And they're kind of all inside the box. So I try and get students particularly cut the shape of the plate that they want to start with instead of using the right time. Immediately break out of the box as soon as you can and start in a, in a sculptural way. Kathy, what's, uh, maybe it's not here, but what's the most challenging print that you mm -hmm. to work on? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a question you had, Bill, sorry. No, 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 no. I think it's a great question. Yeah, it's a good one. And why? Yeah. I was introduced to a young man named Anthony Kirk. He ran Elden Dean Press, he's Scottish. And he came to the Blackburn studio and he said, where do you buy steel? And he said, we don't buy steel, what, what steel? And he said, well, you use zinc in America, it's the base metal. Everybody uses copper, but you use zinc. We use steel from the UK, because it seems to be the industry in the UK. And so he made us all buy a piece of steel, which turned out to be an eight foot piece, four foot by eight, but like a big wood panel, $20. So I could mess up a plate, throw it out, get another plate. It didn't just color the end. This Paul Brock with the, with the metallic leaf is an operative that I didn't have to put it on. This operative had to be put into the box, fused onto the plate, the possibility of screwing it up. Every step is a possibility to not get exactly what you want. And steel operatives automatically. When you wipe the ink on the plate, there's a tendency for oxidation to happen with copper and zinc, and with steel, you get bright, luminous color. And so it, the, what the artist wanted was showing up at the first proof. But then he wanted this gold metallic leaf, which I bought at a, a framing supply where they put metallic leaf on frames, and it's called variegated copper, so they you could actually see the pattern that they were squares, and there was a blue circle of heated material that made this beautiful variegation on the material, but I had never glued down a metal leaf. And that had to be on a dry paper. So the shrink stretch of registration had to be accounted for on a different level. So that was very challenging. And then I had to make it stick. What was I going to stick it with? Well, I went to the, I, I went to a guy. They were doing. They used to do window glass with gold leaf designs, and so they would use something called sizing, which would stay tacky for 24 hours. And you put the gold down and let it sit for a while, and you take a soft brush and do the extra. I used printing ink and tried a few samples, and it happened quite quickly. 
that I could reinvent what was needed and did a beautiful job. And I still have the excess leaf that came off of that. I actually had a parapet outside my studio and I took a brown paper bag and scuffed everything and I didn't want to put it out as a pollutant. And I still use it in I'm, to handmade paper. I put the leaf into the handmade paper because I'm, I'm after my mother's heart still. I decide that. So that succeeded and every step I took, I was learning something new. So in terms of challenge, that one was more challenging. But that artist was the biggest hearted, lovely storyteller. He called himself a Brooklyn cowboy. And big challenge. He walked around chewing on a cigar. Boy, did I hate that face with that cigar sticking in What? Uh, but he was a wonderful teacher. He started the program at CalArts. He married Miriam Shapiro, who's yeah. famous for FemArt. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. that was a challenge. A lot of the times the artists made the plate and brought it to me, so it wasn't. It was more learning how they would print it, which would have been different. Everybody prints the technique. It's like kitchen. How you cook, stew, boil, boil, use electric, use gas. Everybody gets to their, you know, finished product via whatever they, you know, whatever they learn. So it's it's the kitchen arts. Oh, so, yeah. Challenging. The Al's toilet, which is you have to get up to it because it's this this I photographed icicles out here. It's so spectacular. This is a story book. And uh, Fred Hershaw is very famous for doing images of Brooklyn streets. And I would kind of go to the kid back helping and I'd say, Hey, Fred, let me know when your printer dies so I can be your printer. He'd say, I'm my own printer. And I'd say, Oh, get over yourself. I need a job. Give me some printing. And he said, You're not going to be able to print this. And I said, Someday you're going to need a printer, and you just want to train me now when I'm willing to do this. And he was like, never mind. And one day I get a phone call and said, I have this job, but it's going to require on one plate to put each different color in. And they're very close. So my little a la poupée paper came in handy that I was willing to do. A very He didn't have the patience to do that. As much as he makes the plates, the printing of the plate got to be a burden. And I got the job because I put my... Put in my mouth. And anybody who knows this store, it's closed now, knows it was a kind of a cheap Charlie's of toy stores. And the signage, which I love what he did here, is so spectacular. The sign, you can see it's like a piece of opaque plexiglass with lettering on it. You can see the fluorescent lights come through. That's masterful draftsmanship. Those gray tones that that is made up of is, is on all the plates. So it has the subtlety of his ability to do an orange, a blue, and a black is fantastic. So learning that from him was a very big challenge. Was, and that was in the printing with the plates. Spectacular. And if you get up, the icicles are really icicles. It's really cold at nighttime. It's what is captured the light beautifully. And, it, and in printmaking, it's an interesting process because that's called mesotint. And so that whole plate, or the plates were rocked with a tool, a rocker, to go ahead and bring up a burr on the plate. So the entire image, or the image was created by working reductively. So everything that's lighter was burnished and scraped off of the plate. And so what you're seeing is, I don't know how many plates were in that particular print, but multiple plates to go ahead and make that final image. Yeah. One's probably gonna come to the collection <laughs> but we're really hopeful. <laughs> they, they, they admired it, and it's the baby of the group in terms, yeah. in terms of scale. So I love that they were like, oh, and that Fred Mershon on it. Oh, they found the Fred Mershon. It's a love affair. He's a very teddy bear of a man. He's very mm -hmm. lovable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that always impressed me in the years that I would go to Kathy's print shop and stop in and see what she was doing is the transformation that would happen in the processes she was working with. Because every time she would move to a different print shop, it seemed like one, it got a little bit smaller and the water was further away. <laughs> so what happened is that she started to transform from working with processes that had more 
chemicals connected to it, that had more solvents connected to them, to going into a more safe process environment. And so you can see that within the prints here. And so the one I'd love for you to go ahead and talk about is the one we're next to. So that process, the red one that's here, Kathy calls silk aquatint. And I think that tells the story of how it's done. But it is primarily done with fabric, which connects to her background, and with acrylic. So it's acrylic paint on top. So there's no kind of solvent in that or acid in that at all. No corrosive agent being used. So it's good. Yeah. Emma Hamis shows up with a book, and there's a little tiny half blurb in the book where an artist takes some silk organza, very fine silk fabric, glues it to a piece of masonite, a substrate that's rigid, and then he uses acrylic paint to stop the weave from holding ink. And he inks it up, and he basically did like what looked like a stage bit operative with a series of tonal changes like this piece. And I said, I have an old curtain, which was my mother's, and I pulled it out of the cabinet. And I was using a lot of um, styrene plastic, which is sign painter supply. You'll see things, you know, rise and roll, and the sign that it rolls up and throws out at the end. So I used something that was easy to cut. And uh, basically, you cut it and snap it, and it breaks so that you can make a shape plate. And he came from uh, California. He's Portuguese Spanish, so he's bilingual. And he came to me for a private lesson. He wanted to take the class, but he wasn't sure it would have been a waste of time being a, an adult student in a class. And um, I gave him a private lesson. He came to the class. And then he started doing these, which is he's dropping paint. I make the plates. I sell the plates ready to go. And he rolled a roller so that that blob of paint created different you can see the direction, and it's that pucker pattern of the release of the roller. Of course, you have to rinse your roller right away if you're going to try this, so you don't leave acrylic paint on it. And then you let it dry, and it's ready to print. So there's no acid. It's happening right there, and the materials are inexpensive. So he gets a grant to go to Spain, where they're doing big old presses and cast iron this, and everybody's working in copper, and they're scraping, and they're doing aquatins. Um, I picture one for a bearded man for some reason that he's working with. And he takes a great big piece of plastic and he glues this down and the next day he has a show. He's printed his whole, he's made and printed his show in two days. And everyone in the studio is like, we worked years on a plate to get something like this. He came back, had a couple of shows in New York, did a few catalogs. God bless him. We traded prints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a print within our collection that I kind of which was here, it's a green one, it's green and black, and I believe it's 22 by 30 or larger, and it's made with that particular process. And as I remember from the stories that you told me, it was done relatively quickly in a very spontaneous way. I moved to a studio in the 90s where Bill was my intern, and in select, I had to downsize, the, the building wanted to quadruple the rent, and I couldn't stay where I was, so I, one of my assistants, I said, help me locate a new space I need. I want North Light. That's one of the, you know, if I'm going to move, I'm going to try and get what I want. I need a concrete floor that can hold a press. I want water in the space. And I want to be in walking distance from my home. I decided to keep it local. I didn't want the studio in my home. I wanted to be near work so I could get back and forth. And so Isabel whose work is the orange-red one, that puts the platforms. Um, she took the checklist, she found the space, she called me up, the landlord's here, come over and talk to him. So I said, yes, 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 yes. But someone was occupying the place, the space. So they had their, it was a silkscreen, uh, the silkscreen baseball caps. They had these big octopus kind of things to work with. Anyway, it was full of people and industry. So I walked around and it had North light and that walking distance, it, it had everything. So I tell him I need to talk to my husband. It's a big lease thing. Um, I get home the same day and he calls me and he says, Somebody else wants the space. Oh, I hate this part where landlords play this game. And I said, What does that mean to me? And he said, I, I will honor our 
verbal contract, but you have to come over now with the first check mm. and go ahead. So I said, I'll be right over. So I ran back to the studio and I signed the lease. And then when the people moved out, I came in to figure out, measure the space to where the equipment's going to go. And I'm like, where's the sink? Where's the sink? Where's the water? Oh, Isabel, called Isabel. There was a sink here, right? She said, yeah, I saw a sink. Where, where did you see a sink? There was no water. I am water dependent. I wet my paper. I etch water. I clean everything that's old. I rented a space under pressure without knowing it had water. And I thought, and now I will get rid of all my acid and start going green. And I was blessed with somebody who invited me to Japan to study Japanese woodblock printing, which is water-based, which is, uh, there's no acid. You carve the wood and you print with water-based, so you just need to remove it. The sink, in that, the sink in that studio was a little tiny vanity sink and I did have to fill a vat for water, so I'd have a siphon and a bucket, and bucket of water down to the thing and bucket it back. But you know what? That's I didn't have to dig a well or you know cut down a tree to make a log cabin. God bless our ancestors who set that stoicism of work ethic into my life. And so I, that studio I had for about fifteen years, yeah. right? mm -hmm. um, and it worked. Yeah. Yeah, so a little plug for, well, actually a resource for you folks. So Kathy went ahead and had a, all of, a lot of her collection put online on her website. So if you go to her website, you can actually see a lot of this work along with a lot of other work, and it's all labeled very well as far as technique, the artist that did it, the size, the year, and then so on. And this entire show is actually there on the website. And so it's a great resource, I think, educationally for everyone. Wow. I bought a, uh, a tin of uh, business oh. cards, which probably will be something. Well. Thank you, Joe. So I'm a teacher, and it's uh, I collect so I can do show and tell. So I actually bring this work out with me and put it on the table. Because if you see everything through the computer, you've lost that intimacy contact of scale and the velvet of Aquatint and the kind of qualities that uh, different prints have burrs and furriness and richness of the black and the tonalities of blacks that you don't quite get on the computer screen. So I'm very interested in defying the, the um, ubiquitous medium of the, uh, I taught on Zoom, so we know how harrowing that was. <laughs> yeah. How much but you know what? The response after, well, I've talked to different teachers. I find students really got back to their hands. They really wanted in on the messiness. Give me an apron, let me play. Can I stay all night? Mm -hmm. Can I keep, can I use this egg? Can I try this? Can I run peanut butter through the press? Will it print? You know what It's not a good print. <laughs> and then it rocks. <laughs> but you can, you can print food. Yeah. 